Hi friends, I hope you're having a wonderful day today. If you don't know, my name is Bailey Sarian and I'd like to welcome you to my study and to my podcast, Dark History. This is a chance to tell the story like it is and to share the history of stuff, honestly, we would never think about. At least that's the goal here. So all you need to do is sit back, relax, and let's talk about that hot, juicy history goss. I'd like to begin today with a word from one of the classiest people ever to live, Mozart. Oh yeah, you know him? You know him? Yeah, one of the greatest musical composers in the history of the world. That's right. He was playing music for European royalty by the age of five. He wrote his first symphony at eight, just like killing it, right? And when I think of him, I mean, my favorite song, Requiem in D minor. That's why I listen to when I wake up in the morning. I lay in my coffin, I put on my Mozart, and then I rise. It just, it slaps, it goes hard. But the reason I'm talking about him is because not only is he known for his bomb music, he also wrote some beautiful letters to his family. Let me tell you this one, okay? It's a letter to his cousin. I have it right here. <clears throat> now Mozart wrote this, okay? Quote, I now wish you a good night. Shit in your bed with all your might. Sleep with peace on your mind and try to kiss your own behind. Oh, my ass burns like fire. That's right. This guy wrote that. So I guess like he sent a lot of these letters to his family and this was just one of them. And I don't know about you guys, but I was just a little surprised. I mean, you know, he's very successful. He's like, wow, he's Mozart, right? And a lot of the times when we think of stuffy rich people just, you know, being stuffy and rich, at least I think of them as being, I don't know, bougie in their castle, drinking tea and never saying anything inappropriate ever because, you know, like, would you ever curse in front of your grandma? No, exactly. Well, maybe, but me, no, I get slapped. What I'm getting at is um, I think a lot of us have been taught that saying inappropriate things is considered quite trashy, but that's just not true. Everyone says naughty things from time to time. I mean, even Mozart. So I wondered why? Why, Joan? Why are we running from swear words when they make us feel better? I mean, they help us express ourselves and sometimes they even make us giggle. So what do I do when I got questions? I start Googling. And before we go on from here, I just have to give you a heads up. There's a lot of swear words that I'm gonna be talking about today and I wanna do them all and we don't have enough time, but I'm gonna dig into like three big ones. But if you have kids around and stuff, Put on some headphones. If you don't care, that's on you. You know, whatever. I'm just letting you know. A lot of cursing up ahead, okay? So, hide your kids, hide your wife, hide your dog, put on some headphones, because we're gonna be talking about cursing. And I know the censor daddies are gonna be very mad at me for this episode. So I'm gonna go hard. I'm putting my whole pussy in it, you know? What is up with curse words? Where'd they come from? Why are they here? How long have we been using them? I have all sorts of questions that need answers. And the first one I'm gonna start with is a personal favorite and the one that is easiest to answer. And that's the word bitch, B-I-T-C-H. Now, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, like the rumors as to where it started from a female dog and the lie detector test determined that that was not a lie, okay? So the word bitch actually does come from a female dog. But because so many female dogs have so many puppies in a litter, the word shifted to mean slut. So people kind of were like, oh, she has a lot of puppies, therefore she's a slut. Even though the litter of puppies come from the same dog, you know, it's like, okay, that doesn't really make sense, but okay. So it's been considered a harsh insult for a really long time. But I mean, over the years, let's be honest, we've been taking it back. I mean, yeah, no one wants to be a bitch, but you, you, you can't lie. We all wanna be that bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like that bitch, right girl? Okay, anyway, so it got me interested in knowing like where all of the curse words came from. So bitch is an easy answer, it's female dog. <laughs> That's really all it is. But you know my favorite thing to do? When I see a hot guy, I go up to him and I say, hey, nice bitch. And it works every time. Works meaning, you know, 
you know. Anyway, so let's start with the word shit. S-H-I-T. Can you use it in a sentence, please? Yes. My cow had a nasty case of diarrhea all week. My barn is full of shit. Well, friends, I know. A lot of people think they know where this word shit comes from, but like a lot of other curse words, it's clouded by a mysterious little urban legend, if you will. Back to the 1800s, people would collect cow pies, you know, cow poop, and they used them as fuel for their ships. Now this would be super handy to the people because cow pies weighed less than, I guess, other liquid fuel, saving them space on their ship or their boat. But then they ran into a bit of a problem. You see, if the cow pies got wet, like with splashes of water, rain, moisture, just wet, the gas within said cow pie would expand. And if left to expand for a little too long, these pies would turn into shit bombs, okay? Shit explosions, explosions of shit. Not ideal, Mm -mm. no (laughs) ma'am, okay? To avoid any literal shit from hitting the fan, sailors would go to extra lengths to make sure that the cargo containers with cow pies were kept high and dry. Now to make sure of this, they would write ship high in transit across the crates. And it's funny, well, is it funny? Yeah, it is, because when this is abbreviated, it's S-H-I-T, ship high in transit, S-H-I-T. Right? Fun story, huh? I guess it's not true, but a lot of people believe it, it. it's true. So like maybe there is some truth in there. I just want to tell you the story because I actually think it's kind of clever and I could see it to be true. There's just no hardcore evidence that it's true. You know what I'm saying? But it doesn't matter because it doesn't just end there. I mean, the word shit has been traced back even further than the 1800s. I guess the word shit started out in Old English, but it was spelled S-C-I-T-T-E. Shite. And it was like a neutral word, meaning cow diarrhea, pretty specific. And the kind of word that you'd honestly just hear on a farm, it had no bad connotation. There was no profanity around it. It was like just a word to describe literal cow diarrhea. An earlier version of the S word shows up in an old English medical textbook from the ninth century. Now in the medical textbook, it said, quote, sometimes a person's food digests badly and turns into an evil liquid shit, end quote. Which love, yes. It just shows that the runs have been around since the ninth century. And like literally same shit, different era. Like we can all relate to having the runs. Too much Taco Bell, late night, you know, Del Taco. TMI? Okay. So then an interesting thing happens. Back in the Middle Ages, which is like the 13th through the 15th century, pooping was something people did together. Oh my God, yeah, it's so cool. The idea of it's really cool. Just follow me, okay? Because it was a time to socialize, shoot the shit, That's probably where it comes from. And it was just something everyone did together. There was no single stall bathrooms or little stall dividers. It was one big room where everyone was doing their business. No shame, no phones, just talking things out, you know, just sitting on the the toilet like, hey, what do you got going on today? Tell me about it, you know? And honestly, you probably really get to know someone when you're locking eyes, just like, squeezing one out together. That's some bro shit right there. The downside of these big bathrooms was that like they were a breeding ground for all kinds of diseases. Yeah, wasn't pretty. So then when the Renaissance era comes around, people feel smarter. They're feeling educated. They're like science, we know her. There's more money and people could afford to start building houses with more rooms. And with more rooms, people made more bathrooms, their own bathrooms. And honey, this changed everything. People started getting used to doing their business in private. So going potty and talking about it became very taboo. It was like, wow, that's trashy. Like poor people talk about that, going to the bathroom, you know? It was also just a sign of status. The rich people, 
You know, they love status. Anytime they can brag about something, they're gonna do it. And now that they had their own bathrooms, it was like, oh, we don't shit with other people. Oh, you know, they love an excuse to look down on anybody. So this is when we see the word shit become kind of like a low key diss. The holidays came early this year, ladies. If you're still not sure what to get the man in your life, then all you have to do is pull down your shirt and show them a booby. Or you can look no further than our friends at Manscaped. Manscaped is the leading men's hygiene brand that just launched new products that your man will actually use. It's time to give the man in your life the gift of smooth balls and a good shower time experience this holiday season. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash dark history. Ladies, I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes you don't wanna see Santa's beard in your dude's pants, unless you're into that, you know, no shame there. Inside the Performance Package 4.0, you'll find the signature lawnmower 4.0. This electric trimmer has proprietary advanced skin safe technology. It's also waterproof, so he can use it in the shower, which is great because then you don't have to deal with the hair like all over the bathroom, you know? It's kind of annoying. Manscaped is also going beyond the groin with their new ultra premium body wash. It's infused with aloe vera and sea salt to keep his skin feeling clean, nice, and moisturized. But honestly, I I love this body wash. It smells so good. So look, it could be yours too if you want. It's nice, okay? You guys could just share. Tis the season to load up on Manscaped products. So get your man, your dad, your brother, or your friends the best gift of all. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash dark history. Every guy has Manscaped on their wish list. So get him products he'll actually use this holiday season. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com slash dark history. Get your man a gift you'll both enjoy the gift of Manscaped. His jingle balls will thank you. So by 1508, very specific, this is when you see the first documented example of someone using the S word as an actual diss. You wanna hear it? Yeah, this is what this person said. Quote, thou art a shit, end quote. <laughs> Someone was angry. Now back in the day, it was an insult that was only used towards men, but then shit is also a verb. Well, shit as a verb has also been around forever. The first time it was written down was in 1335 in a poem, so romantic. This poem said, quote, whoever so sniffs it, he is ever so wretched. When in that place, you must shit in there." End quote. I really like that opening, whoever sniffs it. Reminds me of like whoever smelt it, dealt it, remember? Okay, so great, we have these examples, but uh, when did it become like a way to express ourselves when we messed up? You know, sometimes when you are running late, you spill coffee on yourself, or I don't know, you left your sim in the pool for too long without a ladder. And the only thing you could do is say like, well, shit, right? So when did that start happening? And surprisingly, not till way later in the 1800s. Cue American Star Spangled Banner Song. On July 5th, 1865, an army surgeon named Private James Sullivan, he got into some major trouble when he was told to get into uniform by like someone in charge. And he replied, quote, oh shit, I can't, end quote, which, I try to find out like why he couldn't, but I guess it's just a big mystery. It doesn't matter. But this is the first time that we have on record like this man using the word, oh shit, as like a reaction. I mean, this is like a big deal, okay? And back then this was an even bigger deal because this is a man in uniform saying the S word to his boss. But hey, the next time um, you say, oh shit, just take a moment and thank Private James Sullivan, because he's really the pioneer who made it a reaction. God bless America. And finally, the first example of someone not giving a shit comes from everyone's favorite author, James Joyce. Ah, yes, James Joyce. In his 1922 book, Ulysses, he describes someone as, quote, a white arsed bugger. I don't give a shit for him. End quote. 
which I love that. I don't know who that guy is, but he does not give a shit for him, okay? Now, people were probably using this in like everyday language before James wrote it down, but I love that not giving a shit is right there for all of us to see in classic literature. And this is a side note, but like this is why classic literature is so important slash beautiful because it's a timestamp as to where society was at the time, how they spoke, what they thought, and what we have in common throughout history. We've been cursing and angry at people for many, many, many years. In the 1930s is when we start to see the word shit as an adjective. In other words, to further describe someone or something. For example, like um, your friend Bob is shit-faced. Maybe he's a shit head. Maybe he got shit tits, you know? And then we did the impossible. We, the people, reclaimed shit. Oh, we celebrated it. And by the 1970s in America, we started calling things that we loved the shit. Oh yeah, brother, I love America. It's the shit. We also have more positive spinoffs like holy shit, dope shit, cool shit, hot shit. But nowadays, shit has kind of uh, evolved and is used to describe crap or stuff or unwanted items, sometimes a negative thing. So it's kind of come like full circle. Like, oh yeah, I'll be over in 10 to drop off all that shit. Uh, we need a, a shit counter. We need a curse counter. Nowadays, the word shit is more of like a chameleon. It really depends on the context. I mean, it can be a negative. It could be a positive. It can mean poop, stuff, a noun, your ex, and an adjective. It's all based on user experience. And isn't that just beautiful? Really? It's up to you, baby. What I'm getting at is um, I'm kind of glad that the communal shitting is over. Or am I? I wouldn't mind shooting the shit with everyone. Throughout history, shit has just been there for us. I mean, there are only a few things promised in life. Living, breathing, dying, and also shitting. Mm-hmm. We all shit. Yeah. Great. Thoughts? Okay, cool. Great. Dude, Paul's dead. Okay, Paul has had a long weekend. We can't rely on him much to add any commentary because look at him. He's a fucking mess. Paul, wake up. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Hmm? 80% of people have subscriptions they completely forgot about. Maybe for you, it's an unused Amazon Prime account or a Hulu account that just like you know, that you never use. But there's this great app that I use that helps me keep track of all of my expenses. And because of it, I no longer waste money on subscriptions I do not use. You might have heard of it, it's called Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill. Now this app shows all your subscriptions in one place and then cancels for you whatever you don't want. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. I've definitely been in a situation where I found charges for subscriptions that I signed up for and then after like the seven day free trial, you know, forgot to cancel been there a little too much, or you may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel, and then Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash dark history. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash dark history. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash dark history. The next curse word is so popular that it is in the top 1% of all words searched online. Yeah, it's an action, a noun, a verb. It's an insult, it's a sin. I mean, it's got a strong K, you know? And maybe you can, you can guess. F as in fupa, U as in ukulele, C as in canoe, K as in ketchup. That's right, my friends. Right now we're gonna talk about the word fup. I love this word, it's my favorite. I'm sorry, but I really do. Now what's the definition of fup? I don't know. Well, I looked it up. It's usually obscene and it's like to engage in like sexual, they call it coitus, which I was like, what the hell is coitus? <laughs> It's like make sexuals with. It's also another way to express anger, contempt, or disgust. You know what's funny? When I was a kid in high school, I sat next to this weird kid. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't weird, but I thought he was weird. I hope he's doing well. 
I hope you're doing great. I sat next to him and he always had some weird nonsense stories and facts and stuff. A fact that stuck with me was that the word f actually stood for fornication under command of the king. He's like, that's what it stands for. I'm like, what do you know? What do you know? I was like, I don't know, I don't know nothing. Anyways, I guess the kid told me that the king who was in charge at the time, he legally demanded that the people in his kingdom have sex to make sure that people were making enough children. So like his job was literally to like watch people bang for the country, you know? And it wasn't just the kid who believed this. I mean, during research for this story, this story like is repeated millions of times. Um, a lot of people believed it. And honestly, it sounds pretty legit. But once again, it's a made up story, which is a bummer. So I found that kid on Facebook and I was like, hey, remember Spanish class when you told me that shit? Listen, eh, you're wrong. I'm just kidding. I didn't find him. I think he died. So the, <laughs> so the exact country where the word comes from isn't really known. That's because different versions of the F word have been around or have been found in languages like all over the world, each with their own spellings. There's fucka, which is F-U-K-K-A, fucka, fuck, fike, and ficken. I like fike. That's a few different ways to spell it. But researchers tend to narrow its birthplace down to what is present day Germany, um, Sweden, or the Netherlands. So yeah, of course, like it makes sense that maybe the Germans perhaps may have invented the word f It's a little aggressive and they perhaps are known for, you know, being a little, a little I didn't say aggressive, maybe. Anyway, so in the year 1278, I guess there's this guy walking around in England and his name was John Le F Legit name, John Le F Hey, Mr. F you know? Some historians believe his name might be the earliest recorded instance of the swear word F in the English language. Hold for applause. <laughs> Great. And we all know this because Le F name shows up in the administrative records for King Edward the first but he was not part of the royal family I mean his name was recorded because I guess he was imprisoned for double murder whoops I know and this is an assumption on my end but I was like maybe this is why the word f is linked to being negative I mean think about it double murder pretty bad. And this whole idea of digging into court records must have like inspired others to do it because there was another English researcher who found an interesting name in court records from the year 1310. We don't know what his offense was, but there was an outlaw wanted by the court and this outlaw went by the name, get ready for this one. His name was Roger F by the Naval. Yeah, F by the Naval. Baby, I don't know what was going on there, okay? My guess is that he was trying to f by the navel, but I don't know. Was that his name? Who, did he choose that? How'd he get that? You know, I had a lot of questions, but no answers, which, what the hell was that, you know? So what I'm getting at is that the word f really didn't, it didn't, it didn't thrive with positivity. It was surrounded by double murder and f by the navel. So, you know, but it's the 1500s we can really thank for putting the F word in the history books and associating it with moving back and forth. Motion of the ocean. I'm talking about sex. And we also see it turning a little bit more aggressive where the F word literally meant to hit, strike, or penetrate. Now things are getting a little violent with the F word. For example, the first time we see the, the word f being used um, a little bit like more aggressive was by an anonymous monk. Yeah, which I was not expecting that, okay? But surprise, surprise, I guess this monk was really pissed off, okay? And he was pissed off at whoever was in charge of the monastery. So he opened up his little diary and he wrote in there, quote, abbot, end quote. Like, man, if you pissed off a monk, you had to do something really bad. And this monk was pissed. So yeah, it also became a direct and some would say like unrefined way to refer to sexual intercourse. And as we've learned many times in dark history, sex and anything even acknowledging that it exists is heavily frowned upon in the olden days, even now, shit. I mean, sex was just, Disgusting, taboo, we never talk about it. Just like the word shit, it was just like, ugh. 
No. So the F word from the very start was considered offensive. And throughout the years, I mean, for hundreds of years, it's continued to be used like that. The one thing about the F word is that it never really changed. It was society that changed around it, like in our very own backyard in America. Around the 16 and 1700s, there was a big group of people that moved to North America. We've talked about them um, many times before. It's the religious group called the Puritans. I roll because they came over here and just like ruined everything. Did they? Maybe, maybe, I don't know. But when you think of them, you just think of the word pure. They want to be as pure as possible for their Lord and Savior, Jesus Henry Christ. The Puritans believed that things like live theater and poetry could corrupt the mind. I mean, they're not wrong. Have you seen a movie? The f is going on? Anyways, but the Puritans believed, you know, all that should be outlawed. So I'm sure maybe in your in your little noggin, you can imagine how they felt about the F word, bitch, straight to hell. You know, like their heads are exploding. They can't even comprehend. It's so aggressive, you know? In the 1800s, historians started to see the F word evolve more and like start to be used as we know it today. It turned into a, a slang, a hard hitting way to insult or, or hurt others, or just to talk about sexy time. Those Puritans though, they no likey. No, nay nay. So they used their influence on America to push society to be more pure. And as a result, you could not find the F word in books or even dictionaries. And then on top of that, for some weird reason, the federal government gets involved. I know, plot twist, over a word. The United States decided to go ahead and pass something called the Comstock Act of 1873. We've talked about this a lot of times. I hope you remember, if you don't, you're fired. But this introduced the country to annoying things called obscenity laws. And like, you remember the dildo episode, blah, blah, blah. Come on, we've talked about it. I know you remember. I believe in you. But not only did this law ban sex toys, it wanted to destroy and ban swear words forever. Like you couldn't print them anywhere. Even if your doctor wanted to write some, I don't know why your doctor is using the F word, but maybe he's like, she needs a friend, you know? Your doctor couldn't do that. He could go to jail, she too. Nah, there's no women doctors back then, sorry. We were stuck at home. So like if you told your doctor something hurts versus something really hurts. I mean, those are two very different things. But if he decided to put it in writing, straight to jail. You know what I'm saying? Like dangerous. It was even a thing in Hollywood. In the early days, there wasn't a set of standards like filmmakers had to follow. So things were a bit risque. Uh, directors could show a little here and there, some skin, you know. Um, they could make some sex jokes. It was fine, no one died. But once sound was introduced to the movies, <gasps> there was a threat that naughty words could be said. But what about the children? So they had a solution, the people, the pure ones. They put something called the Hayes Code into place, which said that swearing in movies was a big no-no. Now, I know what you're thinking at home. What about the whole First Amendment thing? Freedom of speech? You know, that didn't apply here, okay? Nothing applied here. But when you tell humans to not do something, what happens? You wanna do it more, right? Like you can't cuss, what are you gonna do? So it didn't stop everyday people from talking how they normally talked. Um, people were saying, some were making, simple as that. And around World War I and II, we start to see people getting very creative with their curse words. Like they found kind of ways around it. So have you ever heard of the phrase foobar? Foobar? No? Well, let me tell you. It means f up beyond all recognition. I didn't know that. When I learned that, I was like, what? Maybe you have a friend who's gotten too much plastic surgery. It's very much a thing out here in Los Angeles. It's very unfortunate. But you could be like, yeah, their face is foobar. There's another one, snafu. Maybe you've heard that. It's like an olden term, right? It's commonly used when someone makes a mistake or screws up. Well, it actually stands for situation normal, all fucked up. So what I'm getting at is that people found ways to sneak the F word into their everyday um, verbiage. And I love it. 
I love it. I love it when people get creative. But the F word wouldn't need to live in the shadows much longer. The 1960s comes around and baby, listen, that was a time of huge social change and people doing all sorts of drugs and stuff to expand their minds, of course. You know, it was a time of cultural revolution where people wanted to be free to express themselves sexually and vocally. So the people took to the streets, protested against the man, and, and guess what? I mean, it worked. Because in 1965, that Comstock law got tossed in the trash. And guess what? Guess what happened? For the first time, 400 years too late, but for the first time, the word f shows up in the English dictionary. Congratulations, you're in. Get in here. F Come on, f little f Get your ass in here, you know? You made it, boy. And then that Hayes Code that said movies couldn't swear, well, that too went away in 1968, which allows us to have award-winning lines from movies like, quote, I've had it with these mother snakes on this mother plane, end quote. Iconic. Now after this, was off to the races. Even the Supreme Court gave it a thumbs up. They're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Some guy protesting the war in Vietnam was arrested for wearing a jacket that said the draft. And while the court said that arrest was BS because the F word is protected as free speech. Hell yeah. So now we see it starting to go from totally negative to also meaning something positive. Like, uh, man, that guitar solo f rips, brah. And when the internet rolled around, oh my God, it was like the Wild West. Anything you can't say in real life is now safe to say online. So, f boy, in the comment section. <laughs> Actually, please don't. So it had me thinking like, is there a reason why we love to say it so much? It just feels good, it's heavy, it's strong, that K. And guess what? There's actually a reason behind that. Now there's a study that says using the F word is a great stress reliever and that some mental health researchers want us to actually use it more. There's also some research that says swearing actually helps you manage pain. And the same study found that cursing could lead to social bonding. It's so precious. On the count of three, let's all say f One, two, three. Fuck! If your mom came in to yell at you, tell her that the lady on TV said you were allowed to. So the next time you get in trouble saying a curse word, be like, the doctor told me that it helps with my depression and stuff. You know, of course, use your discretion. Don't go around saying to, I don't know, your grandma. Don't be like, grandma, f you, you know? And then blame it on the girl on the internet. But you can point back to this study, grandma. I'm just trying to bond with you, okay? It's either this or we take a shit together, Grandma. Pick one. Before we get into the next word, we should check in on the curse counter. What are we at? Don't make this a drinking game because you will die and I am not taking responsibility for you dying, okay? But let me know how that goes, you know? If you do do it. It's fall, baby. Yay! I absolutely love this time of year. I mean, who doesn't? First of all, I like to switch up my home to make it more seasonal. I take out my holiday decorations, cozy blankets, and also the candles. I also switch up my personal care routine as the days get colder. I take extra steps to keep my skin and hair moisturized since they tend to get very dry nowadays. Way has everything you need to keep your hair healthy and looking great all winter long. Plus, they've got amazing gift sets that everyone on your list will love. I personally have fine color treated hair and after a few days without washing, it starts to feel really weighed down from the styling products I use. That's when I grab the Way Detox Shampoo to clarify my hair from all the product buildup, hard water deposits, dirt, and also oil. And as the air starts getting cooler, my hair definitely starts to get drier. So I use the Way Leave-In Conditioner to keep frizz, tangles, and breakage away. And during this holiday season, why not treat your loved ones to their own healthy hair routine? The Way Better Together Kit includes the best-selling full-size leave-in conditioner and a full-sized detox shampoo for just $40, which works for all hair types. There's also the Three Way Kit because, let's face it, Three ways are better than one. 
You're welcome. Now this kit features best-selling travel size detox shampoo, leave-in conditioner, and also the wave spray to treat, hydrate, and style your hair. Discover all the ways to share joy this holiday season. Go to the way, T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com slash dark history to get 15% off your entire purchase. That's 15% off your entire order at the way, T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com slash dark history. Next up, we got like one of allegedly the worst words you could say ever, right? This is uh, the worst word you could ever call someone. That's right, baby. I'm talking about seeing you next Tuesday. Here I go. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Come. I said it. Now, this one always kind of baffles me because it's like, if you ask anybody, it's the worst word you could ever say. And I'm like, why? I don't get it. Because the dictionary defines c as, quote, the female genital organs. I guess that's so bad, you guys. So bad. Or there's another, like, alternative um, definition. A term used to refer to a contemptible, contemptible person. I think the best way to use this word in a sentence is to quote the famous movie Saturday Night Fever starring John Travolta, that great Scientologist he is, huh? Anyways, in the movie he says, quote, it's a decision a girl's gotta make early in life if she's gonna be a nice girl or c end quote. Yeah, I thought this was a movie about dancing, disco dancing, but I don't know. They actually ended up cutting the c line to make it a PG, you know, movie. Um, and that way it would be more family friendly. John Travolta. Scientology? What's going on there? You wanna talk about it? You good, bro? Where you at? The country of origin relating to this word is hotly debated among some scholars. Now, some say the word is based on the Hindu goddess Kunti. Love it. And others say it's based on the German word Kanto. But one thing is for sure, everyone agrees on this. It's one of the most offensive if not the most offensive word you can ever call someone. It's been said that c is, quote, one of the few remaining words in the English language with genuine power to shock. I've always wondered, like, why? The word describes part of the female anatomy. <laughs> like, how is that offensive? Why is it always us? I mean, think about it. If you call someone a tit, it's not bad. Like, hey, Junior, tit. You're being such a boob. Even though we don't fully know the exact word origin was seen in writing as early as 1390s. Oh yes. It was even in a red light district in London. A red light district is like part of town where there's strip clubs and brothels and basically like um, sex for sale. The street name of this London red light district was called Grope Lane. Yeah, you hear me right, Grope Lane. I guess during this time in the Middle Ages, it was very normal to have streets named after like the goods that you were selling, like Bread Alley, Grope, Sardines Avenue. Honestly, it makes more sense. If you want bread, you're gonna go to Bread Alley. If you want pussy, you're gonna go to Grope. You know? So at this point, was essentially the same thing as vagina. Like it wasn't bad, it was just slang for it. Like tits is slang for boobies. I like boobies better though. There's an early manuscript found around this time. There's like some advice given to young women on the hunt for a husband. Now this is my favorite part. I'm getting this like embroidered in a pillow. This was advice given to young women on the hunt for a husband, okay? Listen, pass this on to your children because it's, it's great advice. It says, quote, give your c wisely and make your demands after the wedding. End quote. And honestly, work, Middle Ages, work. Like that's stuff that you should really be living by. Give your c away wisely. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can get behind that. And plus, before like all this, c was actually a very popular name in Great Britain. They were wild out there, which honestly kind of sucks now. But maybe back then it was cute. There was like uh, this one guy, his name was James c there was uh, this lady, Fanny C Yeah, that's a bad one, Fanny. Fanny C And then um, there's something called C Pepper. I don't know if that was a name or some kind of like seasoning. Either way, it sounds like I'm making this up, but I promise I'm not, I'm not, I'm coming with facts. Protect your C wisely. Give it out wisely. Love that C
be that c own that c you are the c the c in the Victorian era, the word became shameful because the Victorians are so boring. They hate everything, okay? They're no fun. I hate them. They're just such assholes. But that's not what we're talking about because they're the ones who made everything religious and stale and they made the world just very vanilla. They were obsessed with like church and rules and like ugh, fixing society. Ugh. And like, they were also shaming people about sex and breathing and just being alive, okay? They shamed everybody. During this time, women's sexuality and body were seen as something that was private, should be hidden, not celebrated. Put your away, Barbara. It's not that kind of party. Don't you dare even look at your titties. But most of all, Victorians loved to people shame. Um, once again, people found creative ways to express themselves. So you know how we have See You Next Tuesday? And we all know for the most part what that means. If you're at home, like, I don't get it. What does that mean? See you next Tuesday. Um, I don't know, figure it out. Look, listen, it was one of those things that like, if you know, you know, okay? And people were like, ooh, ooh. So c has been known as a bad word for a very long time, still today, right? But in the 1900s, when this time rolls around and pornography was introduced, the turns tables. The word actually took on a whole other meaning with the rise of pornography in the 1900s. And when people were writing scripts for these porn movies in the 1920s, yes, they, they needed scripts, don't be rude. They need scripts to follow. They immediately started to lean in on, on the cursing. I mean, they believed like, hey, if we add cursing and naughty words like in a script, it would make the film even more forbidden and therefore even more desirable. Huh? Like if they're gonna do it, they're gonna do it, you know? Scandalous, sexy, hot, cuss everywhere. And it worked. The downside to the word was that at this time, it was something that existed strictly for a man's pleasure. So thanks porn. But is ever evolving. She's a free spirit, a true Sag. You can't put her in a box. And something switched. In porn, c was used as a way to talk down to women. Feminists saw the rise of this word in movies and in everyday language as dehumanizing. Like it was seen as a huge insult because it reduced a woman to only her pussy. You know what I'm saying? And women were like, we are sick and tired of being disrespected and belittled by these ugly ass men with small dicks, okay? So they decided to do something about it. They said, first of all, take a f shower, Romeo. And second of all, this is my c uh, you know? And in the 1970s, there was a huge women's liberation movement that forever changed the way women were seen in America. In more recent history, like the last 20 years, women, they really wanted to take that word back, okay? Or just own it. They don't want it to be an over-sexualized word or an insult. They want it to be something that's empowering. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of us listening right now or whatever, you can agree with that, right? I mean, remember, that wise old saying, quote, give your c wisely and make demands after the wedding. Like, yes, 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 you know? I mean, the entire reason we're here as human beings on this planet is because of said c So what's so nasty about that, you losers? It's just a fucking word, I don't get it. I'll never get it. I don't get it. Do you get it? I don't get it. I don't get it, whatever. So these words that we talked about today, you know, when you think about it, they're just symbols arranged to make sounds with our mouth and stuff. Like when you think about the word f bitch, shit, c what's so bad about them? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, nothing. But then they become taboo or immoral because of us, the people, the earthlings, right? Now, here's the funny part. It's still considered unladylike to curse in public. Yeah, like it used to be unladylike to wear pants or vote or leave the kitchen or just like speak in general. But hey, hey cuz, here we are. We made it, you know, like people just are so bored. We love judging and looking down on one another, huh? What does it mean? What does it mean? Anyways, when I hear that swear words were banned from dictionaries for literally hundreds of years, it makes me question a whole lot of things, especially when you find out that at this very moment, you can find the word noob, vom, 
and YOLO in the dictionary. If these words just came from ordinary things like cow diarrhea, female dogs, some murder's last name, also a pussy, why are we so afraid of them? You know, remember when you would get in trouble growing up as a kid and if you said a bad word, you get soap in the mouth? What was that about? I was fucked up. Yeah, I said it. I feel like in conclusion, my thoughts here that like some of the meanest things ever said to me are things with actually no curse words in them, right? Oh, like yesterday, someone told me to go, quote, kill myself in the comment section. <laughs> you know, there wasn't a single bad word, right? They just said, quote, go kill yourself. Because, um, hello, context is everything. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And let's not forget about those scientific studies we heard about earlier, right? Research has literally given us evidence to show that using profane language can have personal health and social benefits. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can relieve stress. Again, help you bond with your friends, express yourself, let out some anger in a healthy way. I mean, it's better than punching a wall or a person, right? Who is it really hurting? And if it's helping you, who cares? I'm not saying you should go around calling everybody cunts because not everybody has the same belief system as like me right now, but I'm just saying, you know? So go ahead, you losers. Call me names. Call me every name in the book because I am rubber and you are glue. And wait till I get to therapy where I will talk about you. Hm. Well, everyone, thank you for learning with me today. What'd you learn? Hong Kong? Remember, don't be afraid to ask questions to get the whole story because you deserve that. Stay curious. Really, it's fun. I'd love to hear your guys' reactions to today's story, so make sure to use the hashtag dark history over on social media so I can follow along. Also, join me over on my YouTube where you can watch these episodes on Thursday after the podcast airs. And while you're there, don't forget to catch my murder mystery and makeup. Uh, I hope you have a great day today. Make your choices. You know, don't go around calling everyone bitches. Let's fuck it, you know, be careful because you never know who can say it to you. They might beat you up and I'm not going to be liable. To wrap up the episode, let's check in with the swear counter. <gasps> oh my shit tits, mother tits, shitty. I said a lot of curse words. Who would have thought? <laughs> if you guessed how many I said correctly, you win. Congratulations. You dirty ass c I'll be talking to you next week. Goodbye. Dark History is an audio boom original. This podcast, let me tell you about it. It's executive produced by Bailey Sarian. Hi, that's me. Kimberly Jacobs, Dunya McNeely from Three Arts, Kevin Grush, and Claire Turner from Maiden Network. We have our writers, Joey Scavuzzo, Katie Burris, Allison Filobos, and me, Bailey Sarian. Shot and edited by Tafatswa Namurunjwe and Lily Young. Research provided by the Dark History Research Team. And a big special thank you to our expert, Timothy J. And I'm your host, just in case you didn't notice, Bailey Sarian. Bye, cuts.